Thanks everybody for uh, coming to GovCon this year, 2019. Um, the session is about unicorn hunting, uh, specifically unicorn engineers. So, you know how to find and keep great engineering talent. Um, start off, tell you a little bit about the company that I work for. Uh, so, I'm with Mobomo. We're one of the sponsors this year. We, you know, brought the lanyards. Um, we do a lot of federal Drupal work. Um, you can see some of the organizations there, NASA, USGS, NOAA. Really proud of our federal Drupal practice. Won a number of Webby Awards, um, both for our development and our, our design. And um, actually a couple of Washington Business Journal best places to work. And we're hiring right now. So if anybody is uh, looking for work, come by our booth. We'd be happy to take a resume. Um, and yeah, talk to you. So we're always looking for good Drupal engineers. Um, so with that, a little, little bit about me. So I'm uh, Jason Schulte. I'm the VP of Engineering for Mobomo. Been with the company for about six years now. Um, actually started, um, a little story, I started with the company um, basically as like a contract developer. So I was like a freelancer. Um, Mobomo is actually headquartered out here in Virginia, so the office is in Tyson's Corner. I live in southwest Missouri, so like a thousand miles away. And so a lot of times I'll get asked, well, VP of Engineering, how in the world did you come to work for a company that's a thousand miles away? The answer is not that exciting. They found me through, you know, a contracting agency and they were just really desperate for developers at the time. So, you know, they were like, yeah, we're going to take a chance on this remote guy. And, you know, so I started working just as a contract developer on our NASA.gov project. So worked on that for a while. After six months, they were like, yeah, we kind of want to make this permanent. So they offered me a full-time position to come on and be an employee. So, yeah, in uh, 2015, I guess it was, um, or no, 2014, I came on as a full-time employee. Um, no more freelance gig. I 100% for Mobomo. Within a month, they were like, hey, is there anybody else in Missouri that uh, would want to come work for Mobomo, do the kind of stuff you're doing? I'm like, I can probably find somebody. So like within six weeks, found another guy. And he was like the second remote, full-time remote engineer working for Mobomo. And so now, six years later, there are 16, getting ready to be 17 of us in Southwest Missouri, all engineers, all working on federal Drupal projects. And we're actually to the size now that we're going to open our first office and it'll be the first remote office that Mobomo's had. So kind of cool story. Um, all that to say, yeah, I'm kind of proud of my background, but a lot of the content of this presentation is about my experiences um, working for Mobomo, hiring a lot of our engineers. I mean, over half of the engineers that we have working for the company now, I've, you know, interviewed, hired, trained, or had some extent of them, you know, coming on to the company. So. A lot of this is based on my experience. So today's objective, um, we're going to be talking about what you need to know about unicorns, you know, unicorn engineers, how to evaluate their technical skills, culture fit. Um, culture fit's actually really important. Um, when to take risk, right? So there was a little bit of a risk I think Mobomo took in finding me, you know, trying to have a full-time remote engineer six years ago. Um, and then once you have a unicorn type engineer, how, where to focus your efforts on keeping them happy, keeping them engaged with your company. So, most obvious place to start. What is a unicorn, right? So, kind of an easy way to think of it. It's not a great definition. It's one I kind of came up with is, you know, it's a, it's a set, a specific set of skills that can be difficult to find in one individual, right? So. This is not the same as a full stack engineer. In fact, if anybody was in our buzzwords presentation, you know, I don't even like the term full stack engineer because it's very non-specific, right? It doesn't really, you know, even um, give much attribution to the fact that we have specialties and those are important back end, front end, DevOps, security, networking, things like that. So it's not a full stack engineer. Um, it's also not what I would call a ticket eater. So, you know, somebody that's just consuming tickets, just increasing the velocity of your project, that's not really a unicorn either. Um, th that might be what you need, um, but I think a lot of times a unicorn is going to have some kind of non-tangible, non-engineering qualities, you know, really. So, you know, stuff that can include leadership, you know, 
maybe even some sales capabilities, writing, communication stuff. There's, you know, definitely some non-engineering qualities, I think, that, that come along with the Unicorn Engineer, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. So, the next question I think is relevant to ask. So if you, you know, if you're here, if maybe you've decided, you know, your project, you need to add an engineer. Maybe you don't even know if it needs to be like this unicorn type, you know, qualifications or not. Um, why are you, you know, needing to add this person? Why do you need a unicorn? Um, I think there's a lot of different possibilities. And it's pretty relevant, you know, because it helps you identify, you know, is it a unicorn that you need or is it a ticket eater or one of those other types, you know, that I've talked about. So some of the possible examples here, you know, for, you know, needing a unicorn would be you have your project is at risk, right? Um, I think that's kind of a really dangerous or it can be dangerous to look for a unicorn to save your project, you know, come in and be a hero. And if you're, if it's already in trouble and you're approaching a deadline, you know, <laughs> unicorns have magical powers, but they are not miracle workers. So, you know, um, maybe the project is at risk because you've had some dramatic scope change and it, you know, this new thing that's added to your project is outside your current team's expertise and you need to add some staff that way, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, always qualify as a unicorn either. Another example of why you might need a unicorn would be, you know, the business is growing, needs are changing. That's happened at Mobomo a number of times. You know, we have a sales opportunity, we gotta pull one of our great people from one project or somebody that we think is doing well and ask if they can do more by helping us land this new, you know, federal agency or new account. Um, so that's gonna leave a vacancy. You know, so that's kind of an area, and I'll talk about this more later, where you may be developing a unicorn. Somebody who just started as a front-end engineer or developer or whatever, you start asking them to do more, you might, you know, you can surprise yourself by developing these people internally. Another example of when you might need a unicorn is you've got an old unicorn. Um, so <laughs> this doesn't necessarily refer to age, <laughs> right? Old in the sense that somebody that's been with your organization for a long time and they've become indispensable, right? They're just, they're so key in what they do every day and that's great, you appreciate them, but over time you probably have never asked them to do less, you've probably asked them to do more and they get tired, right? So the idea of old unicorn here is, yeah, sometimes, you know, you, we all have risk of burnout, people need a break, I'm thinking of a couple of guys specifically that, they, you know, they need some backfill, right? So, and they're back, and because they're so indispensable and they do so many things, their replacement has big shoes to fill. So you're trying to hire a unicorn there. Overall, you know, these different ideas, something is missing. That's, that's why you're looking to hire a unicorn. Um, all right, so. Now we're going to start talking about how you identify a unicorn. And so this kind of graph, some of the reds in the middle may not be very distinguishable, but you know, we're talking about the concentric circles here. And basically the bigger the circle is, I think that's um, a quality that's easier to identify. You know, so talent being the easiest thing to identify in somebody, then passion, then I think maturity, then accountability, and the hardest one I think is, you know, servant leadership. So the rest of the next few slides, are, we're going to go through each one of these individually. So talent, I think that's the easiest one to identify because it's, you're really just talking about um, somebody's technical skill, right? So that's the resume, right? That's the report you get from the recruiting agency. That's, you know, you can literally have them take a test for their coding knowledge and stuff like that. I think when, in, when you're talking about an engineer, I think some of those tests or some of the more formal evaluation methods can be a little bit dangerous. I will tell you some of my best engineers, we would give them a traditional coding test. They would not do very well, <laughs> not when they started anyways. But I think now they, they would do better now after they have had some context, been on a project, understand things a little bit, bit better. But um, yeah, I think, you know, beware of some of the more traditional methods for, you know, evaluating talent, judging talent. Um, a lot of our guys, especially in Missouri, didn't really start with Drupal experience, and now they're some of our, you know, lead engineers, leading leading entire teams. So, 
The next category is passion. Um, you know, this is one of those where, you know, obviously you probably all heard the quote, you know, if you find something you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life, right? So I think a lot of our guys, our engineers, they just like tech. They like doing coding. They like doing programming. You know, this is one of those areas where in an interview, I like to ask about non-professional experience because it is relevant. You know, what do you do in your free time? Do you, you know, I'll, I know our guys, we talk about our home labs and our media servers, and one guy likes to develop mobile game apps in his spare time, right? Stuff that's not necessarily Drupal related, you know, maybe to the project, but it's still technology related. And you just know they just have a passion for it. And that, I think, makes a big difference. It's something we, you know, I interview for, and, and it's a big part of our culture, you know, that our engineers will literally just, you know, have talk shop just nerd out on whatever, um, and we, we enjoy it, so. So the next one is uh, maturity, um, kind of a self-awareness thing. So huh, unicorns and really engineers in general can be opinionated, right? Um, very opinionated sometimes. So there's a maturity aspect here to look for, you know, when it comes to how do they share and express their opinions, you know, obviously, there's tons of books and things you can read on soft skills and how to have, you know, uh, difficult conversations and things like that. But kind of the idea around maturity is like, you know, it's okay to have an opinion. Actually having healthy debate is good as long as you don't take it personally and you're okay with the best idea wins, right? Like that's kind of a mature perspective. Um, you don't like communicate in ultimatums or absolutes, right? If, uh, if there's an issue with something and you don't like it and you say, well, we just need to start over from scratch. Like that's not really a mature answer to say we have to start over because you don't like how it's built. Like there's, you know, the willingness to compromise I think is a sign of maturity. And that can, this can be a little bit tougher to screen for. Um, but I think when you have people internally and you're looking at developing, you know, a unicorn internally, it's something you'll, you can get a sense for over time. So the next one is accountability. I think um, your, your true unicorns actually want this. You know, they want to be held accountable and it kind of cuts both ways. They want others to be held accountable too. Sometimes they're even willing to do that. Um, you know, one example of this, I can think in my very early days at NASA, we were really shoving code in there fast. <laughs> I mean, faster than what we should have been. And, you know, we were creating regressions, like as you would expect whenever you're, the velocity is that high, the team was, you know, that small. And so one of the guys was like, hey, you know, we need to start reviewing each other's stuff, right? And granted, that's kind of a more common practice now for us, but back then it wasn't, right? And it was his idea, like, you know, we need to review each other's code and not just, uh, okay, it looks good. I mean, he actually wrote a document that is, this is how you do a good peer review. This is what you look for. You should be taking time. When you're done reviewing someone's code and you sign off on it, you actually have accountability for code that someone else wrote. That is a good peer review, right? So finding people that take that much pride in their work and actually want to be held accountable for it, want to hold others accountable, you know, that can be really tough to find. But, you know, that's why it's one of the, the smaller circles on my graphic there. But... Yeah, very important. And then the last one, and this one, you know, your unicorn, well, I'm going to get to that here in a little bit, so I'll, I'll stay with this. The last one is servant leadership. So I said this was all about my personal experience. I wouldn't, wasn't going to talk about stuff you can read in books. Obviously, this quote comes straight from a book. Um, you know, servant leadership is all about making goals clear and then rolling your sleeves up and doing whatever it takes to help people win. In this situation, they work for you. They don't work for you, you work for them. Um, and really, for me, that's all about kind of my story and the guys that I hired early on that are now leading teams and the style of leadership that they've developed over time is really that of, you know, the whole team succeeds or fails together. I'm not throwing individual guys on the team under the bus. Like if there's a problem in the code, it's not one person's problem, it's the team's problem, right? So with that mentality, you are really supporting your people and your servant leaders are inspiring loyalty rather than demanding it. You know, 
the you know the people on the team feel like their manager or their tech lead has their back, supports them in their ideas, and you know successes and failures, mistakes. You know we're always going to support them. So, um, all right. So now we've gone through all the different qualities and how to identify unicorns. So where are they? So. Surprise, it's not magic. I wish I could tell you, like, just go to this website, they're all listed right here, and you just pick one. And <laughs> no. So obviously there's recruiters. If you've worked with recruiting agencies, I've worked with a bunch of them. You can find them there, but, you know, surprise, a lot of unicorn engineers are already employed. So, you know, they are, they're not looking, if they're not looking for a job, you're, you know, they're harder to find through recruiters. Um, a big thing is, you know, for us has been developing them internally. And, you know, sometimes you get somebody good in a position, good as a front end developer, and they're just so good at it, you don't want them doing anything else because you know they're, they're great at this, this one thing. Um, but I think if you take some risk, ask people to get outside of their comfort zone, give them the opportunity to fail, you know, that's actually kind of a thing, a culture thing within Mobomo, opportunity to fail, let somebody to try to do something new that they haven't done and see what, see what happens, people will surprise you. I mean, sometimes you have to pick up the pieces if it's not, you know, an overwhelming success, but, you know, you, you can develop people internally if you give them a chance, push them a little bit, push them outside their comfort zone. Another thing that's worked really well for us uh, at Mobomo is referrals. So unicorns flock together. The, the first few guys, you know, the, the guy that I hired first, um, you know, met him at like a local meetup, and then the second guy I hired was his friend, and then the third guy I hired was the second guy's friend, <laughs> and like it went like that for like the first six or seven of us, and it still does. Um, some of our best candidates that we get come from referrals, and I think, you know, I've talked with the guys about like, why, why has this worked so well for us, and they've told me like, when we refer somebody, we're really kind of picky about it. We aren't, we're not just gonna refriend, refer a friend and think that they're gonna be okay. We realize that a friend coming in is a reflection on me personally, so I'm not gonna do it unless I think the person is actually gonna be good. And they also, they work, you know, these are guys that work really hard, kind of know what the stakes are when you're working for large government agencies. So when they refer someone, it's funny, the resume, usually doesn't look that great, doesn't look like it applies, but you kind of know what the work ethic is because they're referring people like themselves. So that's the, you know, the idea that unicorns flock together. You know, people are friends with other people that are like them. Um, and then, you know, kind of the last bullet there is, you know, if you don't really know what you're looking for in terms of some of those leadership qualities, the soft skills, the maturity, you know, they can be, seem like they're impossible to find, right? So that's kind of just knowing what you want, what are the, what are the needs, going back to that earlier slide about why are you looking for a unicorn? Is it to save, you need a hero to save a project, you trying to grow the business, you know, things have changed, whatever. So now let's say you've got a unicorn, right? You've got someone on your team, that you're developing them, then whatever, they're great. So how do we care for them? How do we keep them, right? Proper care and feeding of unicorns. So, you know, I think in a lot of cases for us, our unicorn engineers, it's not all about the money. It's not always about just the, the compensation, right? They actually want to be involved. And really, you know, for, for us, it comes down to that bottom thing there, influence, right? Influence within the organization what kind of decisions are being made at top level, you know, being able to provide feedback on that and, and be listened to. So, you know, I'm constantly working on this with the, with the, you know, the technical directors that are under me, the guys that I, we really rely on to like run teams and deliver, deliver on our projects and stuff. We have to listen to them and they like to identify problems <laughs> and they're not wrong. We can't always fix them right away, but we do try to make plans, take action on some of those things. It ends up being a lot of compromise. Um, the measure part we could probably get better at, um, but then there's some amount of review. And you know, like I said, when we first started, we didn't do peer peer reviews on our code. Somebody, you know, came up with that idea and a plan to do it. Now we do it on every project. You know, that's some kind of measurable improvement. 
but we're still working on it and your unicorns are going to want that you know that feedback usually with upper management that you know feeling like they're going to have some influence on the direction of the company the direction of their own career um, the direction of people coming up behind them you know that's the stuff they care about that's really how you compensate them is by giving them your time honestly okay so talked about how to identify them where to look proper care and feeding reality check they're not all 10 out of 10 in every category. They're not all perfect, right? So sometimes they don't work out. And so uh, kind of our last slide here is, you know, we do need to realize these are people, they have, you know, personal lives, right? You know, they have egos sometimes, can be very opinionated, right? So they're not, all, they're not always perfect. Um, it is kind of a special skill to kind of, you know, wrangle them or be a unicorn shepherd, so to speak. Um, they're also not ticket eaters. I think you have to have the mindset that they are going to have some kind of tangible impact on your organization, but you know, they're not, ne not necessarily just giving you raw velocity. Um, and then also there's, you know, don't forget that keeping them happy is a continuous process, right? And it's not just about the money. And then last, you know, finding unicorns through different non-traditional methods of hunting is, you know, what's worked best for, for Mopomo, right? The developing from inside, the referrals, and then, you know, occasionally you get a good one or two from the recruiters. So that is it. Thank you, everybody. And yeah, any questions? No. What is it? I know what a baby unicorn is. It's like it's a shimmer or a sparkle. I have no idea what a, I would just call it a flock or a herd. I have no idea. It's a, it's a blessing of unicorns. A blessing. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Anybody here that's a recruiter, like from an agency or, you know, recruits talent on a regular basis or just does the hiring for their organization? Yeah? Yeah? Cool. Any good, uh, any good tips out there? You know, because I'm looking. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of thought about that too. Um, my wife is a, a CPA and she's like, you know, I might have you give this talk at one of our conferences and like, yeah, completely different industry. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is really the truth, yeah. I mean, the talent part of it, of, you know, finding an engineer has actually been a small part for us. And it's sometimes it's hard to convince customers and upper management that's like it'll be fine they'll pick it up they'll learn it you know I, I know this guy it's gonna it's gonna work out okay um, it can be hard to sell that but we have a good track record now of like that's how it works you just find good people not necessarily good engineers yeah on one of the last slides you had a box called measure and I guess that's part of the review process and the conversation with management I think it, it's it's the yeah yeah, and it's the idea of, you know, whenever um, keeping a unicorn happy, they're, they're going to be opinionated about, you know, I'm thinking of one person in particular who's like, why do we, why does, you know, Mobomo make this mistake? Why don't we have better policies or procedures in place? You know, what can we do about this? And it's like, you know what, you're right. We should be better about this. You know, what's the plan to do that? And then... The idea that, okay, we're trying to implement this plan, here's been, you know, the measurable improvement, you know, and, and just kind of, kind of continuing to iterate over that. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a frequent one thing with, with the unicorns is like, you know, we don't want to repeat our mistakes, we want to make sure that the business is getting better, you know, policies, procedures, you know, whatever. Um, that's all about the person, but all the procedures in general. Yeah. 
and measuring, yeah, that, that you are doing changes and they are having a measurable impact on the business, the organization, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, sorry, I um, did you mention much about salary? No, I didn't mention much about salary, but I will tell you, you know, coming from Missouri, that's obviously a thing uh, from Obomo specifically is that Salaries out here in Northern Virginia, the job market's highly competitive, and yeah, the salaries are higher here versus in Missouri. One good thing about being remote, obviously we're still all U.S. citizens have to get a public trust clearance um, in order to work on federal government projects, but yeah, the salaries are, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40% cheaper where we're at in Missouri versus out here in Northern Virginia. I guess more specifically though, Oh. Or, or actually finding it. Um, do, how much do you think salary factors into that? Um, yeah, I mean, people kind of know their value, you know, depending upon the market and how long they've been doing this. You know, they, they kind of know what, it's, what their value is. For us, it's nice that we have, you know, really cool clients, NASA, you know, saying that you get to work on NASA.gov is really cool and some of the other, you know, the work that we've done, I think attracts people. And yeah, there can be definitely be an aspect of the interview, which is me selling Mobomo as an enjoyable place to work. So yeah, compensation, I'm, I, be honest, it's, it's not irrelevant, right? It is absolutely 100% relevant, but that's not the only thing that, that some of these people are looking that's for. That's not how you keep them. Right, and it's not necessarily how you keep them, exactly, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you were asking more from the getting them to join in the first place or to keep them happy after you've got them. Well, yeah. I, I think I've looked at some companies where you see some higher performing companies who are paying a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's interesting that Amazon's base right now for golfers in the like 20 to 250 range. Yeah. And so trying to maintain people who are tangential around that is right. very difficult because that's not the typical group of developer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, we absolutely, absolutely struggle with that too, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I, I work for Obama, I'm not a unicorn, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> You're all unicorns. Okay. <laughs> but I would say just as a plug for my own company, I would happily, I, I don't make huge money, and I would happily work for that where I'm at forever. But I, the company culture influence is a huge factor. Like when I, when I say, I don't think this is right, I don't think that we're doing this right, I know that people are listening to me. And whether or not that gets fixed immediately, probably won't. We don't move that, nobody moves that fast. I don't move that fast. It takes me forever to get um, But uh, I know I'm going to be listened to, and I know that we're going to put things in place to try to address what there is going on. Yeah. Um, and if I'm wrong, someone's going to also say that. We're in that conversation. And conversely, if they don't listen to you and don't res respond to you, you get PO. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. And it's not that salary doesn't matter, it's just that it's going to. I've worked at plenty of places that have paid me more that I have wanted to leave. There's so a price. You, you end up paying one way or another. You end up paying. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's not always the catalyst to maybe move someone onward rather than the, uh, than the actual yeah. Or them uh, Yeah. The other thing is you, you guys are fully distributed, right? So, yeah. I mean, that is a huge factor. And I don't know if the numbers from Amazon are uh, uh, you're in Seattle. In Seattle, I guess, or making 220 in <laughs> Seattle is probably the equivalent of making 80 in other places because you're paying $5,000 a month in rent. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah cost of living in Southwest Missouri is can, very cheap. <laughs> we, we have this conversation, we're a fully distributed company as well, but we have this conversation with people that apply that are in New York and they're asking for a New York salary. And it's just unfortunate, but we can't. We can't pay the same, but we can pay competitively on a national basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have, a, I have a question. Uh, can you uh, name like very common tell if the unicorn is starting to be unhappy, or do you ask them if you happy? 
Yeah. You ask them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've gone through different iterations of this at Mobomo, and uh, you know, the most recently it's been like a quarterly kind of review cycle, and you know. I would say our performance reviews aren't like your traditional performance review. It really is a time to like have a conversation with your supervisor outside of the project work, which is, yeah, how are you doing, right? I mean, are you feeling burnt out? Do you feel like, you know, you want your board, right, doing what you're doing? Um, and so, you know, kind of that one of the maturity aspects, you know, can come out in the, in the reviews whenever they say, yes, I'm unhappy, you know, I'd like to be doing this, and then I, I respond with, okay, let's make a plan to do that, and let's get there in, you know, three to six months, right? That's something that's reasonable. You can approach it with a plan and, like, make, make it happen, right? Somebody that gets unhappy is like, get me off this project tomorrow, <laughs> you know, that's, that, to me, is not a unicorn or not, it's not a mature perspective on what's, you know, feasible. They're, you know, don't want to try to make it work, basically. So, um, as far as what to look for, I mean, in burnout, you know, I can think of some examples where people have like, you know, really been fed up with a particular project or the client maybe, and yeah, committed some code that was really substandard by any measure, right? And it comes out in the review and you ask them about it and they don't really care. Like that's a pretty obvious red flag, right? Um, how you react to that, it depends, you know, sometimes it really is, you just need to get them onto another project. Maybe you know that they're actually really good and it's just this one team or client or whatever. And so, you know, you try to accommodate them. If it continues to happen, it's like, well, maybe we can't make you happy, but yeah. It's not all organizations that like I've worked in higher ed before, and, and we usually get to, I'm, I'm not a unicorn at all, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 um, but it's very interesting because they're usually, the directors, we, we start, I'm a, I'm a front end, kind of like, uh -huh. started doing back end um, development, but um, we get assigned in communications, and they're not technical. <coughs> What, what to look out for. Sure. Um, and then they just told the shops and the leaves and they can't hire to the developer for a year. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah, I will tell you, I spend a lot of time communicating with, you know, my top three to five, you know, technical directors, top guys, and, and you know, I really work to build trust with them so that they can really be as open, you know, they can cuss about whatever's bothering them, whatever Mobomo's not doing right, not serving them. They know that there's not gonna be any repercussions. They can, you know, vent to me. There are obviously some professional limits to that, you know, but I, I do that, you know, and talk with them a lot just to build that trust so that I'm not surprised. I don't ever wanna be surprised if somebody, yeah, quits or whatever, right? And then I encourage them to do that with all of their teams, you know, let them, tell you how they feel, you know, if it's if it's important enough that you need to raise it up to me or we need to go to my boss, the CEO, you know, that's what we'll do. Um, Mobomo, I think we have a really good culture. Our, the, the management style is very transparent. You know, all of our executives are very approachable and that's kind of a big deal. I think it's, it's helped us with a lot of retention, keeping people, so. I think to add to that, I mean, it's another um, that, you know, like the culture of just always being able to have a conversation. You know, yes, there is like the one-on-ones that we're going to have on our, some kind of a basis, but just knowing that if you're just happy, like, this is a problem, you know, think about like a risk risk assessment, like, you know, essentially you're communicating risk to your, to your manager, like, you know, for some reason this isn't working for me, you know, um, and I'm, I'm letting you know, like, if this continues to go on, I'm going to get burned out or whatever, right? And making sure that that's you know that relationship is approachable, and also continue to communicate. Like, hey, if you're having a problem, like, reach out. Like, we'll we'll do the best we can. And sometimes the answer is, I'm you know I'm glad you brought this up to me. I can't do anything about it now, but I'll, I'll make sure to try to address it. You know, that's always that communication. You know, stuff that we hear. So. Cool.
Yeah. Hey, I wanted to comment on your uh, on your comment about testing your engineers before you hire them. Uh huh. I'm almost, and, and, and I'm also a full stack developer. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I get people, you know, I get Amazon and Google and get through me and I'll, I'll get on the phone with them and say, I'll, I'll come and talk to you but I'm not taking the test. Yeah. I'll just tell them flat, I'm not taking it. Yeah. And I'm not taking it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't call me back. Yeah. And then, and then six months goes by and they call me back again. And it's just like, hey, shit, shit, I told you last time. And I didn't take and the they test. They can't, yeah. well, whatever, I didn't have test with their corporations. But yeah, we used to do it too. Yeah. I mean, we found some tests and, you know, we... And it, you know, I you know, I was like, you know, I got some feedback from candidates like that test was really weird. I don't, you know, I don't know it was very good. It was really obscure questions, you know, about very specific parts of the language itself that are not even used that much. And I'm like, okay, so I took the test. I was like, yeah, this is this is really bad. Like, <laughs> yeah. If I were to Mm-hmm. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Right. I hope to never see it again. Yeah. But, you know, that database is like, I've never seen that. What's that? Seven. Seven. Seven, yeah. I don't know. All right. Yeah, so it's true. Well, but, you know, they did hire me because I was working in San Oh. So I worked in there, actually. Okay. So I worked in there, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, this is a question. Uh, do you have to find that your unicorn is a large center of kind of a leadership to be under to the lower level developers? Yeah. The lower level developers were actually feed a lot of angst and frustration to the unicorns. Oh, yeah, that de that definitely can happen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've seen some of that, yeah. So, that's, uh, to me, Really good indication that there's a big problem on your team if the unicorns that have to relate it to, your, to the upper hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so you, you, you can also use the, it's not really maintaining them, although you are if you're actually listening to your unicorns. Mm -hmm. Explain to all you to, to, to all, the, all the problems you're running into. That's a good way to maintain uh, trust in them, but also root out some of the underground fires that are going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've definitely had situations where it's like, okay, we, you know, we need to help you make better use of your time instead of holding someone's hand, right? Because that's not the best use of a unicorn's time, right? Um, we definitely try to mentor people, right? I mean, there's, but you got to have something to work with. You got to have somebody who, I like to say, people that want to do engineering, not learn engineering, right? So some, some people, you know, want that hand-holding and being, constantly being taught, and some people want to, like, figure it out and do it, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, anything else, guys? Thanks, everybody, I'm gonna run to the airport. <laughs>